Good evening. It's good to be with you tonight. If you will, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 11. We were going to continue our study there in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11. Hope that you guys are, are doing, doing well. I know that it's been a long time since we've seen some of you all. I hope that you guys are staying healthy. I uh, hope that the isolation hasn't been too much. Uh, for those who are, are somewhat Canadian, uh, happy Canada Day. Uh, for those who aren't, uh, happy half the way. We made it halfway through 2020. Um, it feels like it's been a lot longer than just half the year. But we're going to continue there in Proverbs chapter 11. Um, go ahead and begin with you there in verse 1. We had started last week into the true Proverbs of Solomon. We mentioned that chapters 1 through 9 dealt with um, introduction material, uh, getting people ready for the Proverbs themselves. And then starting in chapter 10, you have the actual Proverbs of Solomon. In fact, you have that heading right there, right above verse 1 in chapter 10, the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, I had had some time uh, trying to figure out how to conduct the class through Proverbs because there is no coherative um, narrative. There's no story that's being told. Um, in fact, what it is is a collection of Proverbs. And so I had thought maybe breaking it up into categories, into topics, and dealing with a variety of Proverbs all on the same topic. Um, then I remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, that he has spent a lot of time uh, both writing and arranging Proverbs. And so I figured there's probably a lot of goodness that comes from the arrangement that Solomon put together. So um, we're just going to go through the Proverbs themselves, kind of chapter by chapter as we can. And we're going to spend maybe some more time on some of them and maybe a little less time on others. Um, and that's just kind of my prerogative as a teacher and uh, for the sake of time for the class. We had mentioned verse 1 a few times already as an example. He says that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Uh, this is obviously the principle taken right from Leviticus chapter 19 uh, in verse 35, where he deals with how for the Jewish people, they were to have just practices when it comes to their ways, weights, and measures. However, what Solomon is getting at here is not just to reiterate Leviticus chapter 19, but what he's getting at is to be just and fair in all of our dealings. That an individual who is willing to have a, a false balance, you know, that's an abomination to God. And the one who has a just weight is his delight. And we're going to kind of work through um, the next few verses where he deals with the, the recompense of the righteous and the reward of the wicked. He kind of ties some of these ideas together uh, in the next few verses. He says in verse 2 that when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Um, this is a theme that's going to be kind of repeated a few times throughout uh, the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 is the one that I was taught to memorize growing up. The pride goes before destruction and a high spirit before a fall. Um, it also crops up again in chapter 18 and in verse 2, where he mentioned that a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expresses his own opinion. Or sorry, verse 12, rather. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty. But humility comes before honor. This is an oft-repeated theme throughout the New Testament as well. Uh, that pride comes before disgrace or destruction or a fall. But with humble comes wisdom. It has been said that you cannot fill a cup that is already full. And that is giving you know, an apt description of if you believe yourself to be wise. If you believe yourself uh, to be um, someone who is knowledgeable, then you're never going to look for more of it. And so he says that with humility comes wisdom. And so you know, as we're looking at the very first couple of chapters of Proverbs of you know, how do you respond to, to wisdom's call, humility has to go hand in hand with that. He then talks about integrity in verse 3. Now, remember, we're looking back at verse 1. This is going to be uh, while they, they stand by themselves. Uh, the Proverbs also kind of fit inside of a larger context that Solomon has arranged them into. And so he says, Integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous, treacherous destroy them. 
We've been talking about you know, some of these kind of concepts kind of flow together of integrity, uprightness, uh, wisdom, um, blamelessness. All of those things are going to be going hand in hand. He says that there is a guide that happens when you have integrity. There is something that's going to lead you on a continuous path that you are going to um, go from point A to point B. But there's a difference between that and the crooked. The crookedness, it, it destroys them. There's no path, there's no guide, there's no uh, following that. Once you step foot on that, there is nothing that is going to keep you on track. And then he goes and compares the righteous and the wicked for the next few verses. In fact, uh, down through verse 10, uh, 4 through 10, are going to be kind of direct contrast between the righteous and the wicked. And it has a lot to do with um, their recompense, their ultimate reward, and how they live their life. So let's go ahead and read those verses together, uh, recognizing that each of these stand and fall by themselves. At the same time, they also fit together as a theme. So verse 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless keep his way straight, but the wicked fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectations of wealth perish too. The righteous is delivered from trouble, and the wicked walk into it instead. With the mouth, the godless man will destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge the righteous are delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there is shouts of gladness. So he is going to be using some of these ideas to compare and to contrast in these verses. Part of it is dealing with uh, the false balances back in verse 1. Part of it deals with the pride that comes in verse 2. And part of that also is the integrity of verse 3. And so he mentions that, that riches do not profit in the day of wrath. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1 in verse 18, Zephaniah, um, either borrowing from this concept or just speaking in prophecy towards his people, speak how their wealth is not going to save them in the day of destruction, that there is no salvation for them uh, when it comes to money whenever destruction's on their head. Now, verse 4, though, the question, the statement is, the righteous are delivered from death. And I don't think that he is necessarily speaking here of... Of physical death. And what I mean by that, there, there are a lot of righteous people who die alongside the wicked. There are some cases where we have where the righteous themselves are directly delivered. Um, and this is kind of where you get in some of the truisms of Proverbs. Sometimes what Solomon says is an absolute statement of fact, and sometimes it is true-ish. And, what, and I, I, don't, I, I want to be very clear about the true-ish. He will tell you later on in the book, that you should uh, answer a fool according to his folly, and then immediately say that you should not answer a fool according to his folly. And what Solomon is saying that there are some things that apply in some situations and they don't apply in others. They are both true, uh, but not true in all circumstances. There are some righteous people who have been delivered from physical death. We think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, as prime examples. David and his mighty men through a numerous battles. Um, David against Goliath. And then the, the story kind of goes on and on about Gideon and the 300. There are a lot of people who, through their righteousness, are delivered against all odds. And there are wealthy people who have all the wealth in the world and cannot be saved one iota. There's also a, a bigger meaning to this in verse 4. That if you are swallowed up in this life while being righteous, there is still a victory for us. And that's what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that death is swallowed up in victory. That while we, are, we may succumb to physical death, we will not be succumbed to the second death. And so there's those two aspects, I think, that play together here in verse 4. As you get over into verse 5, the righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight. We mentioned that back in verse 3 when it comes to integrity. Integrity and righteousness are going to be two concepts that kind of go together, go hand in hand. 
um, that the integrity of the upright guide them and the righteousness in verse 5 of the blameless keeps his way straight. But the wicked fall by his own wickedness. You know, as Jesus mentions over in Matthew, uh, those who live by the sword die by the sword. I mean, if you live by wickedness, you're going to fall by your own wickedness. In verse 6, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. You know, the same thing we have here when Solomon says that the righteousness of the righteous deliver them, or the upright. Now, in this case, he has paired that with the concept in verse 6 of uh, their own lust. We go back to the adulterous woman in chapter 5, or chapter 7, or in chapter 2, that there is amount of integrity, amount of uprightness, there's amount of self, um, self-correction that happens for those who are wise, that keeps them and delivers them from those circumstances. But the treacherous are taken captive by their own loss. You know, James mentions this in James chapter 1. Each person is lured and enticed by his own desires or his own lust. So that's you know, what, what we're looking at here is how do you live right, righteously? If, if wisdom, if we have you know, kind of correctly described that as being the skill of righteous living, then that's what we're looking at here in these verses. How do you live skillfully or righteously, how you skillfully live righteous? And one of them here is in verse 6, by being upright, by having integrity. In verse 7, when the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectations of wealth perish too. Now, if you hope in this life only, if you live to gratify the flesh, if you live to just have what you can have here and now. When you die, that's it. You know, and, and a lot of these work like all Proverbs work. That in one aspect, they are straightforward. Uh, you can read them exactly the way that they're written. Or you can use them as a question. If I die, will my hope perish with me? Is my expectation of gain is that gone as well, or do I have a hope that extends beyond this lifetime? You know, that's what James, or that's what Paul writes to Timothy about. That you know, we should not set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but we should be rich towards God and good works. You know, those kind of those ideas go hand in hand. And so as you read these, you know, these are self-reflective questions as well as uh, easily memorized statements to guide us in the future. He says in verse 8 that the righteous delivered from trouble and the wicked walk into it instead. You know, Solomon makes the point in uh, chapter 26 and verse 27 here in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 27. Hey, buddy, I need you to go ahead and stay in there, okay? No, go ahead. Thank you. Proverbs 26 and verse 27 uh, Solomon writes there that whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who has started rolling it. Uh, this same idea that comes forward is, is how many people are caught in their unrighteousness? How many people are caught in their lies? How many compound their problems by continuing their problems rather than fixing them? That's what he's dealing with, I think, in here in verse 9. That if you dig a pit for somebody else, you're going to be swallowed up by it yourself. Uh, if you roll a stone to roll it on somebody else, be careful lest you are the one who gets squashed by it. And in this case, he says the wicked die, or um, the righteous are delivered from their trouble, and the wicked walk into it instead. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. All of these ideas go so well together. In verse 10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoice. But when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. Um, pretty good possibility in the next couple of weeks we're going to be talking about uh, the topic of Romans chapter 13 um, and God's place or God's decision to, to instill governments 
uh, over the world in order to uh, restrain evil uh, for our benefit. And consider in verse 10 what he says, that when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, that there's benefit to leaders uh, being righteous. There's a reason that Paul writes to Timothy and asks us as his audience uh, to pray for the leaders and all those who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and a quiet life that's godly and dignified in every way. You know, historically speaking, uh, if you have a government that is somewhat even bent towards God or looking towards God, things go well. When it goes well with the righteous, the city itself rejoices. On the contrast in verse 10, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. How many times do people uh, get up in arms or, or are overly sad uh, over the death of a wicked person? He says in verse 11, By the blessings of the upright, a city is exalted, and by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Individuals who have a, a good, humble heart, who are put into leadership, often do great things for the people that they lead. And there's a lot of people who are there out of their own desires, their own lusts, their own greed. And he says here that by the mouth of the wicked, a city is overthrown. Now, those things are important for us when we consider the overall attitudes and actions of our, of our leaders. It has a lot to do with how we respond to them as well. And Lord willing, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, verse 12, he then gets into some personal matters in the next few verses. Uh, we have been dealing with the idea of uprightness, of, of having just weights, of having humility and integrity, and having righteousness, and how that interacts in our personal lives. And then starting in verse 12, he then uh, stops that comparison and contrast between righteous and wicked, and he gets into uh, some more personal matters. Verse 12, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense but a man of understanding remains silent. Um, Jesus, I think, speaks to this a little bit when he gets into Matthew chapter 5. You would have heard it was said um, right there. It's on the left-hand page, bottom, left-hand column. I'm sure it's the same place in your Bible as well, where he mentions about anger, You know, talking about whoever uh, says, who is angry with his brother, will be liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable for the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. He says, Solomon says, instead of dealing with the council or dealing with hell fire or judgment, he says in verse 12, that whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Sometimes it is best just to keep our mouth shut and stop talking, it is a lot better sometimes to just not speak ill of somebody else. Our, our, the age-old statement of what our mom said, if you have nothing good to say, say nothing at all. Solomon has this same phrase. If you belittle your neighbor, you lack sense. One of the hard things about Proverbs is that he doesn't, doesn't equivocate. He doesn't say, well, if you belittle your neighbor who's already little, that's, that's fine. Um, he just simply says, if you belittle your neighbor, you lack sense. And a man of understanding remains silent. If you go back to chapter 10, and in verse 19, he deals with this in, in a very similar way that we looked at last week. The words, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lip is prudent. And then again in chapter 14, and in verse 21, he says, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. If we are to love our neighbor as ourself, if we belittle them, if we uh, have a profuse amount of negative words, uh, if we despise our neighbor, then we are a sinner, we are lacking in understanding, and our transgression is not lacking. Those are important things for us to consider when it comes to how do we judge the fruit of our lips? How do we judge the things that we say? Do we say, well, it's only true, or it's only my perspective? Or do we really consider that there are some things we just shouldn't ever say? 
that there's a lot of times we should just keep our mouth shut. And dare I get into it on social media, we have a very large platform that allows a lot of things to be said. And sometimes we should hit delete and never put them out there in the first place. If you belittle your neighbor, you lack sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but whoever is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. We looked at this already back in chapter 10 as well, or a very similar statement in verse 12. He says that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. One of the, I, I've been thoroughly enjoying going through Proverbs. I have been, uh, been wanting to do it for several years now. I have been dreading figuring out how to do it because of uh, you know, the, the lack of continuity as a story. Um, now that I'm digging into it with you guys, I, I've been thoroughly enjoying it. And being able to connect these verses has been such a pleasure. And I hope that you guys are taking some time to do the same thing. He, if we connect those two, two ideas in verse 13 of chapter 11 and chapter 10 in verse 12, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but whoever is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Considering that with hatred stirs up strife and lover, love covers all offenses, the question comes up for us, what do we do? How do we speak? How do we interact with the things that we believe we know or the things that we do know? Sometimes we get the feeling that just because I know it, therefore I should be able to say it. Maybe that isn't the case at all. Maybe it's love that covers up offenses. Maybe it's being trustworthy that keeps a thing covered. Maybe it's hatred for me to say it, to stir up more strife. And maybe it's slander of my mouth that reveals those things. Even if they're true. We're dealing here with the skill of living righteously and having checkpoints for our mouth and having a guard set over our lips is going to be vital to that. In verse 14, he says, Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. This, again, is an oft-repeated thing through the book of Proverbs. Chapter 15 and in verse 22, for instance, he says, without counsel, plans fail, but when many advisors, but with many advisors, there is success. Um, a couple pages over into chapter 20. Chapter 20, uh, there in verse 18, he says, plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance, War is raged. Uh, the same thing comes up in chapter 24 and verse 6. He says, For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. Where there is no guidance, a people fall. There's a big, been a big push uh, in our country very recently to remove guidance, to remove guide counselors, to remove people who keep order in our system. Solomon, thousands of years ago, by inspiration, tells us that when there is no guidance, a people fall. People are not self-governing uh, in the sense that if you just let people uh, exist without government, without order, without law, without uh, some type of retribution for irreprehensible action, it never goes good. A lack of law and order never leads to more righteousness. In fact, it is the opposite. That God has placed authority into the government, into places of, of power, places of guidance, in order for that to happen, to restrain the wickedness of men. And to, to protect those who are innocent. It doesn't always work out perfectly. Because we live in an imperfect world. But getting rid of the entire system is sheer madness and foolishness. 
The same thing comes up in our personal lives. Obviously, um, verse 14 probably rings a bit louder right now when it comes to the, the political and economic systems of our, of our country. But in verse 14 is also very personal. If we keep our own guidance, if we are our own counselors, if we talk to no one and only rely on our own wisdom, we fail. But when we have an abundance of counselors, there is safety. He then goes into verse 15. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But whoever hates striking hands and pledge is secure. The idea of pledging security is, you know, um, is, is the idea of being a cosigner on a loan, that if they're going to uh, renege on their contract, if they're not going to be able to pay, then you are on the line for it. And he makes the point that if you pledge this for a stranger and who you have no idea, then you will surely suffer, suffer harm. Um, but if you hate striking hands and pledge, the idea of uh, Old Testament phrasing for if you like shaking your hands in agreement, uh, for security, then uh, you are secure. And verse 16, a gracious woman gets honor, but a violent man gets riches. Um, this seems to be kind of against everything that he's been talking about. He's mentioned um, back in verse chapter 10 and verse 3 that the Lord thwarts the craving of the wicked. Uh, he mentions back in chapter uh, 4, or chapter 2 rather, and that you should not throw in your lot with wicked men who devise evil and perverse plans. Um, or sorry, that's in chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and following. So it seems like he would be saying, well, the, the, uh, the violent men, uh, they're not going to get anything. Um, but sometimes they do. In fact, that is kind of the exact point. I looked at different cross-references provided by different commentators, and all of them led... Uh, to other passages that would paint this in a positive light, but I don't think Solomon is painting this in a positive light. Um, hear me out. So, he's comparing two things in verse 16. The gracious woman, what she gets, and the violent men of what he gets. So, it's a comparison of genders, male to female, being gracious to being violent. And he's comparing one to the other of honors to riches. Let's say the violent men get rich through drug cartels or armed robbery, or even non-armed robbery? What if they, by their violence, amass a great fortune? That's what he's dealing with in verse 16, because sometimes that happens. Sometimes wicked, violent men get filthy rich through that. And you compare the exact opposite, a woman who is gracious, gracious what she gets is honor in verse 16. And what he is intending us to understand is that a woman being gracious gets something that's far better than riches. While a violent man may get riches, the gracious woman gets honor. And then to kind of follow up with that idea, or to continue on that same course of thought in verse 17, a man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 um, about the individual who is pure of heart or the peacemen or the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, and the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There is great benefit to an individual on a personal level for being kind. Uh, the same thing comes in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus gives that throne scene. Uh, very towards the end of Matthew. And he doesn't deal there with some of the things that we would expect him to deal with of inviting people into his kingdom or inviting people to leave his kingdom or to go into hell. What he deals with is the kindness towards those who are least among us. Those who are hungry and thirsty. Those who are destitute and have no clothing. And he says to those who have been kind to them, he welcomes them into his kingdom. And those who have despised them or have just something done nothing to them or for them, those are the ones who are asked to depart and to leave. A man who is kind benefits himself. And um, we'll probably pick up another verse over in Ecclesiastes as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I believe it is. Um, 
I have it written down as another cross-reference. Uh, it's chapter 11, sorry. That whenever you cast your bread upon the waters, you will find it after many days and give a portion to seven or even to eight for you know not what disaster may happen upon the earth. Both of those are, are following the very same lines. That if you spread kindness, you have more possibility of kindness coming back in return. But if you are a cruel person, you hurt yourself in the end. He says in verse 18, The wicked earn deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. And the sure reward is not simply monetary reward. What he's dealing there with, you know, is that there is a, a larger reward from God that goes beyond simply the wages of now. If you have financially now uh, what you want, but have no hope in heaven, then what good is it? If you lack now, but you have everything in heaven, what have you lost? That's what Solomon's getting us to consider. He says, Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. And again, we know that Solomon cannot be speaking here of literal death and literal life in the sense of physical life and physical death. Because Solomon makes the point very clearly in Ecclesiastes, as well as every person in human history, minus like three people, made the point that everybody dies. And so what he's dealing here with is more than just physical death and physical life. That if you are fewer steadfast in righteousness, not like a one-time righteous act or a semi-occasional righteous act, but if you are steadfast in righteousness, then you will have a sure reward. But if you pursue evil, you will die. And he continues on that theme in verse 20. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those blameless in their ways are his delight. In fact, that's almost an exact uh, replica of the phrasing there back in verse 1, that a false balance is an abomination, and the just weight is his delight. In this case, it's the person themselves in verse 20. Those of crooked heart have an abomination. What drives someone to have false scales? What kind of gain are they, are they looking for? What are they pursuing in this statement? And the answer is, all those things go together. That the crooked of heart are the ones who have the unjust scales. Those who are pursuing after evil and unjust gain, they're the ones that are doing that. And he says that those actions and those people are an abomination to God. But those who are blameless in their ways are his delight. And so he says here in verse 21, Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished. If we lived in a purely materialistic world, if atheism was correct, if there was no God, if there was um, no ultimate heaven or hell, then individuals like Pol Pot, um, individuals um, like Adolf Hitler, they win. I, people who go unpunished for some of the worst crimes in history. There are so many of them who die of old age in their bed, who never face trial, who never face any type of punishment here on this earth. If that was true, then they win. But evil only makes sense. And I'm, I don't mean that evil makes sense, but people getting away with evil only makes sense if there is an ultimate punishment. There are things that cry out in our nature, and justice is one of them. There is nobody on earth that does not cry out for justice if they feel that they are wronged. And yet there is nothing in the materialistic world, there's nothing in a purely physical world that demands justice. It's not a part of evolution. It's not a part of uh, the any theories of this existence that only comes about through morality, and morality only happens with the Creator. And in this case, God is saying that He is going to uh, re-just all of those balance. He's going to make everything fair. And that's one of the big things that Solomon cries out about in Ecclesiastes. He says, why do things seem so unfair in this world? That's what we cry out about all the time. And whenever God looks at us and says that I hate um, an unjust balance, but I love just weights, we ask, well, okay, okay, God, where is your just balance? Where is your fair weights? And the answer is, 
God will ultimately have a punishment for those who are evil. And for those who are offsprings or, or, or springs of righteousness, we get to be delivered. Those are really important things. As you look at chapter 11, he deals with the falseness and the injustice. He makes the promise in verse 21 that God will ultimately right the balances, right the scales, and he will ultimately give punishment. Vengeance is his. He will repay. Now let's look at verse 22 for the sake of time. We're going to kind of keep moving on. We've got a few more verses left. He says, like a, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Um, I don't know how many of you grew up with uh, persnickety grandparents like mine did, like I did, uh, who, who, who found things like this to be humorous and therefore uh, spoke often of them. This is a verse that my grandfather loved, that a gold ring and a pig snout is like a beautiful woman without discretion. Now, we've already looked back in chapter 3 and verse 21, chapter 5 and verse 2, and 8 and verse 12, where he deals with the idea of wisdom going hand in hand with discretion. And he says, that here you have this, this beautiful gold ring, which is you know, attributed to uh, the beautiful woman, but it's all marred by the fact that she has no discretion. For young men, uh, this is a hard lesson to learn. We are often deceived by beauty. We often go towards beauty more than we go towards character. And Solomon is really encouraging his audience, his sons, to consider the fact that character is more important than beauty. And while Solomon does not write Proverbs chapter 31, it is written by King, uh, the mother of King Lemuel. You have a description of the godly woman who is focusing entirely on her character when it comes to picking out someone that you were going to spend your life with. It is very true that you know, beauty is only skin deep sometimes, or that beauty always stays as long as life still continues. Um, that is something that is true. But a character of a godly woman, that is something that is precious in the sight of God. In fact, that's one of the very few things, if the only thing the Bible that is ever quantified as quite the, that terminology as being very precious in God's sight. Um, 1 Peter chapter 3 deals with that. And he says that indiscretion is like a pig. It's a pretty, pretty harsh term. And verse 23 he says, The desires of the righteous and only in good, and the expectations of the wicked in wrath. We had kind of made this connection earlier uh, back in chapter 10. And in verse 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the cravings of the wicked. And again, in verse 20, uh, 24, the wicked dread what will come upon him, but the desires of the righteous will be granted. Uh, we looked over in James chapter 4 and verse 3 last week to make the point that uh, if we pray, but we pray to, for the wrong things or pray to, to spend them on our own passions, then God is not going to grant those things to us. But if we pray for righteous things, those things will be granted. Jesus gives us the analogy uh, that what man, whenever his son asks for a good gift, will give him a serpent. And if, if we as parents are able to understand what good gifts are, will not God also give us all good things? And that's what he's dealing with. That if you desire righteousness, if you desire the good things, not, not the pleasurable things, not the... Um, quantifiably better things in life when it comes to, uh, I don't want silver, I don't want gold, I don't want a small house, I want a mansion. That isn't what he's dealing with. If, if, you, if you want righteousness and justice and goodness and mercy and faithfulness, if you want those things, that it only ends in good. And, but the expectations of the wicked in wrath. He says in verse 24, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Other withholds what he should give, only to suffer want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. A people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing on the head of him who sells it. And all of these three uh, stand by themselves, and all of th these three go together as well. Uh, chapter 19 and in verse 17. 
Chapter 19, verse 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will be, be repaid for his deeds. And 28, and in verse 27. Chapter 28, and in verse 27. Whoever gives the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. There is... So many other sayings that go along with this concept that if you give freely, then you grow all the richer. Love is one of those areas. The more love you get, give, uh, you don't grow poorer with giving love. If you hold uh, your, your possessions with a tight hand, if you believe, if you're miserly with your things, then what you have will never be enough. Uh, you'll never... You always feel like you suffer want. And sometimes you will suffer want. If you bring blessings, you yourself will be enriched in verse 25. It's more blessed to give than to receive. The one who waters will himself be watered. You know, sometimes we, you know, we look at the commandments in the New Testament of exhorting others. When you gather together, uh, stir up one another to love and good works. And yet, oftentimes, we approach worship service and the gathering of the church for us to benefit from it, to get something from it ourselves, only to find out uh, that that is the wrong way to go about it. We get so wrapped up, if I don't take care of myself, then who will? If I'm not mostly concerned about me, then who will ever take care of my wants and my needs? And yet, the principle that he gives out here is the more you take care of other people, the more people you have to look after you in time of need. It's not a selfishness of I'm going to take care of you and you have to take care of me in the future. It's I'm going to take care of you. The end result of that is, is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes people, when they have the opportunity, get to take care of you in return. Those are important concepts. When deals with living righteously, the skills of living righteously, these are phrases that I hope are ones that stick in our mind. That if we give freely, maybe we can actually grow richer through that. And maybe the concept here in verse 24 is not if you give five bucks, you get 15 in return. Uh, or if you give 100 bucks, you get 125 in return. We're dealing with the, the idea that if you give to somebody and you gain their love or their, their respect... If you gain, if you store up treasures in heaven, then you've really gained something. You have grown immeasurably richer. That's important. Here in verse 26, the people curse him who hold back grain, but a blessing on his head of him who sells it. Verse 27, whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor. But evil comes to him who searches for it. If you search for evil, you're going to find it. But if you seek good, you end up seeking a favor in the end. Or seeking favor, not a favor, but favor. Verse 28 sounds probably, probably very similar to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 uh, Charge the, the rich among you not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on him who judges justly. That we should not be rich towards ourselves, but rich in good works. These are hard things sometimes for us to, to really, truly accept. We live in a materialistic world. We are taught on every side to be materialistic, to love and to want more of this life. To want and to love more of this world. But the love of the world and the love of things of the world. The love of the Father does not abide in us if that is the case. And so Solomon tells us, Who, uh, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. And again, sometimes we want to put a very materialistic view on a non-materialistic sentiment. That being righteous does not go hand in hand with being physically rich or monetarily rich. But being righteous goes hand in hand with being spiritually rich. And that's the most important thing. So if you're, if you're kind of going back to verses 24 through 26, 
in looking this maybe in context, that if you give freely, you grow all the richer or flourish like a green leaf. That if you um, bring blessings, you yourself are enriched. If you water, you'll be watered in return. But if you trust in your riches, if you withhold what should be given, you only suffer. If you only curse, if you only hold back your grain, other people will curse you for it. Now verse 29. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind. And the fool will be the servant to the wise of heart. Stirring up strife in other areas is foolishness. Stirring up strife in your own house, extra foolishness. What God has designed is to be um, an incubator of love and peace, an incubator of godliness, a place of, of respite, a place that we can come and be encouraged. If we're the ones who start uh, stirring up the cauldron there, then we're looking for trouble. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind, and the fool will be a servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more will the wicked and the sinner. That is a great capstone or summarization point for everything we've been looking at in chapter 11. This is why I said um, there is, I think, a lot of wisdom going chapter by chapter through the book of Proverbs because Solomon arranged it in such a way that these ideas, while they're independent and you can use them as individual Proverbs, it also fits into a larger context or a larger paragraph. And I think that verses 30 and 31 uh, make a really great point for that, that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. That what we're dealing with is not monetary possessions, it's not physical um, blessings that are lavished upon us, but sometimes it is. Sometimes we get to re be repaid with the fruit of those things, whether it be praise, or whether it be a good name, whether it be someone to stand beside us in a time of need, if we spread our, our bread upon the waters, it comes back to us after many days. If we give a portion of seven and then to eight, you know, we get to be taken care of in return, generally speaking. But how much more the wicked and the sinner? And if you capture souls, and it doesn't mean just going around and having a soul jar and you scoop up souls. He's dealing with the idea that if you lead others to God, as James says in James chapter 5, whoever turns back a sinner from his wandering saves a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. That's what he's dealing with here in verse 30 and verse 31. That's the, the big goal, that a strong man or a violent man might get riches, but the righteous get a tree of life. And if we get repaid back for our deeds, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Chapter 11, like chapter 10, is an amazing chapter, and I hope that you guys take some time to go through it. Um, this is just to, to give you a tasting of Proverbs. Proverbs is not something to be uh, to graze through once. Uh, you don't just go through chapters 1 through 31 one time in your life and you're good to go. It is a book that you are to come back to and reflect on on numerous occasions. It's a book that you are to pick out Proverbs and to memorize them and commit them to heart so that whenever these occasions come up, these things are the things that play through your mind in a way that maybe other verses don't always have that same effect. And so us going through Proverbs is hopefully not the end of your study. It's hopefully the very beginning of a lifelong obsession with Proverbs. I hope that is the case for you guys. Uh, Lord willing, we will get together on Sunday. I know that um, we're going to be trying to meet at the park again, 12 o'clock. If you can, we would love to have you there. Um, I know that we have a website. Thank you so much um, for taking care of that for us. We really appreciate that, Heather. Um, it's, I know that some people have tried to contact us and we've had struggles with the website. Uh, I really appreciate all the hard work you put in. I know that, you know, you, I think you said you have more stuff that you're planning to do, but you spent a number of hours getting more material on the website than we had before. Thank you for taking care of us and for uh, getting that domain back for us as well. Next week, um, we will pick up in chapter 12, Lord willing, um, and we will go from there. I hope you guys have a wonderful night, and God bless.